grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Many of you are aware that when I was younger, I worked my way through high school and college as the manager of several different record stores. I've always had a love for music and rock and jazz and anything else that's out there. And even though I've gone on to other things in life, I still keep my ear to the music industry, just so I'm aware of what's going on and what's happening. Well, like so many other people, in 2009, when Michael Jackson died, I was shocked. He was only 50 years old, and he was just starting a comeback in his career. Well. I watched the news intently for the weeks after his death and all the plans that went into his funeral and all the tributes that came in. But the truth is, what was really interesting happened after he was laid to rest. Because it was after that point that the fight over his estate heated up. I mean, within just months of Michael Jackson passing, both of his parents, in separate lawsuits, challenged his estate. It didn't seem to matter to them that he had already set up a will, he had established a trust for the care of his kids, and he had it all laid out as to who would manage what and when and where. For some reason, that didn't matter. Both of his parents <coughs> fought against that will. Eventually, their claims were dismissed, but that didn't stop the lawsuit. In the coming years, many of Michael Jackson's siblings did the same thing, challenging the guardianship of the trust, wanting a bigger piece of the pie. And even this year, seven years after Michael Jackson's passing, there was a lawsuit brought by Quincy Jones, the famed producer claiming unpaid royalties from the Michael Jackson estate. Everybody is clamoring to get a bigger piece of the pie. And it's sad. What happens when people lose focus of what money truly is and what its purpose is? And that is the very heart of our gospel reading for today. When our gospel reading starts out, there's a young man who approaches Jesus, and he just has one sentence. It's a very simple but direct and straightforward sentence. And he says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, it's fairly simple and straightforward, but we can garner a lot of information from this one sentence. The first, which may be fairly obvious, is that there are two brothers and their father has recently died. Now, as was the common practice at that time, two parts of the estate would go to the elder son and then one part for each of the remaining sons. This was done so that the elder son, claiming his responsibility, could take care of their mother if she was still alive and then fo follow on with the father's business. The other thing we can tell from this is that the brother coming to Jesus is obviously the younger brother. He does not have controlling interest in the estate. We can assume that the older brother has continued to carry on the business of the father as though nothing else has happened. And now the younger brother wants his bit. He wants his piece of the pie. But there's one other thing that we can pretty confidently assume with just this sentence. And that is that the older brother was most likely a disciple of Jesus. Maybe not one of the 12, but probably one of the 72 that Jesus had sent out. You know, it wasn't uncommon at this time for rabbis and teachers to resolve disputes. There wasn't a legal system like we had. The younger brother couldn't sue his older brother in court. And so when they had disputes, they would go to the teachers, to the rabbis. 
And they were the ones who would solve problems. They would mediate between people who were arguing. But that's not what the younger brother asks. He doesn't say, will you mediate? Will you arbitrate between the two of us? He's very direct. Teacher, tell my brother. Command him. Which tells us that Jesus has some authority over the older brother. Well, what's fascinating is that Jesus doesn't get involved. As I said, typically, this is what rabbis would do. But Jesus doesn't jump into the fray. Now, I don't believe that he thinks this is somehow lower than him, as though an inheritance dispute was somehow out of the scope of his ministry and he just didn't want to dirty himself with it. I don't think that's the case. Instead, what I see in this pericope, in this text, is that Jesus saw a greater problem in the heart of this younger brother. And he says, beware of covetousness and greed. And to illustrate that, he tells the parable of the rich fool. Now, you heard Larry read it just a minute ago. Most of you are familiar with it. But I'm going to reread verses 17 through 19. In these three verses, what we have is the rich fool, he has his bumper crop, and he's trying to figure out what to do with all of the excess. And I want you to count how many times the rich fool refers to himself. All right, so 17 through 19. And he, the rich fool, thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Three sentences. Three verses. He refers to himself 11 times. Now realize, Jesus isn't telling the story as though the rich fool is on some off-deserted island in the middle of the Pacific or Mediterranean or somewhere. If he were out there, there'd be no one to sell his crops to. He wouldn't be rich at all. There's only value in his crops because there's someone who will buy them. So the parable is told in the sense that this man is right in the middle of the community. One of the contemporary towns may be found right there in Judah or up around the Sea of Galilee. An area where there are people. There are families. There are elders who sit in the city gate. There are widows and orphans and travelers. And yet none of that comes into his thought process at all. None of it. It's not as though he gets this bumper crop and he says, hey, maybe I'll go down and I'll sit with the elders and we'll converse about the best thing to do. He doesn't even call up his best friend from high school and over a glass of wine, sit there and says, hey, what are your thoughts on this? His wealth has separated him from everyone. His only thought is of me. And the real insight is that in the midst of his wealth, we see his true poverty of loneliness in isolation. And you know, the real truth is that he never had any of this to begin with. None of what he had was ever his. He isn't the one who caused the wheat to grow. He's not the one who sent the rain so that it would grow well. He's not the one who made it grow bountifully. Everything he has is a gift from God. 
And more than that, at the end of the text, we find out that even his life wasn't his. His life was a gift from God. More specifically, his life was simply a loan that God demanded back from him when he least expected. Sadly, that temptation to think of our things as ours, that ownership temptation, it is still very much alive and well today. We talk this way all the time. I do it too. My house, doesn't matter that there's a 30-year mortgage on it, it's still my house, my car, my truck my computer, my phone, my bike, my toys. We talk all the time as though these things, that we have ownership of them. And sadly, the truth is once we start thinking that way, it becomes a downward spiral. Because once I have a little, I've got a taste, and I can't stop at just a taste, I've got to have more. One car won't do. I need six. And they got to be new and they got to be nice. A 1,000 square foot house won't do. I've got to have three bathrooms so there's always one nearby. And it just keeps going. And sadly, the more things that we have, the more we end up paying to protect it. We may not build larger barns, but instead we rent storage space for the stuff that won't fit in our basements. And then we buy padlocks and doors and security gates and security systems and insurance to protect it all. And in a very real way, we end up building these invisible walls that separate us from all the people around us as we surround ourselves with more and more and more things. But as the rich fool learned, those things aren't ours. They never were. They never will be. I was reminded of Luther's explanation to the first article of the Creed. You may not be able to rattle it off, but once I start, you're going to know it from confirmation. Luther writes, but God, he also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. And he richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. It's not ours. He gives it for a temporary and just a momentary time so that we can use it for our benefit and for those around us. St. Paul, he goes on, he says it a different way. In our epistle reading for today, he says, set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden in, with Christ in God. You see, when God claimed you, when you were baptized, you died to the old way of life. And our mind is not on the things that are around us, on the trappings of this earth, but instead our mind is on the heavenly things where true joy and true treasure is found. And the beauty of it is that being a Christian, being a baptized child of God, he places his Holy Spirit in my heart. And it doesn't happen overnight, but over time he works it so that that attitude of greed and covetousness and selfishness, it just sort of goes away. And he replaces it with a heart of love and thankfulness. 
and generosity. And through the Holy Spirit, we begin to see that the things around us aren't ours, but they are used to give God glory and to the benefit of our neighbor. And you know the truth is, there is no place better than that. Being found in Christ, with Christ, in God, where God loves us and forgives us, and we in turn love and forgive others and use these precious gifts to build up the community and the body of Christ. That is where true joy is found. You know, it was sad when Michael Jackson passed, and everybody started clamoring for a piece of his estate. I think it's happening again with Prince's estate. He didn't even have a will. Everybody's clamoring for a piece of the pie. And it doesn't just happen with millionaires. I have heard horror stories of how families are torn apart as children fight over the things of their parents. We lose sight of what is important. We start thinking that the material blessings we have are ours. But the truth is they're not. They're God's. They've always been God's. They will always be God's. He allows us to use them for a short time for his glory. True joy. True treasure is being found with Christ in God. And there, you have a treasure that will never be taken away. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.